tell you, they have sung morning and night. Oh, we got to do better. Come on, we got to celebrate. And these are undergraduate students. And they've sung morning and night. Wow. Don't you remember when you used to kind of could sort of do that? Now, you get tired walking to the kitchen. I understand. Can we give God great praise for Ellison Jones 2022? What a magnificent, marvelous, and spirit-ordained experience. How grateful I am. Let's celebrate these young people one more time. Wow, wow, wow. 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 Our future is bright. Our future is bright. I, I need to um, first say publicly thank you to everybody that's done anything to make Ellison Jones 2022 the amazing success it is already. Um, I'm, I'm not sure where my, where I, my staff is, Laura and Karee and you, Paula, of course, Dr. Flowers. I don't know where you guys are. Are y'all in the building? I know you're always moving around, but you know, wherever they are, can we just clap our hands and say, God, thank you for them. Ray Rousen. Uh, they are, man, they have been just amazing. Um, let me remind you that we have vendors here and we need to support them. They are, I think they're still at the LLC and we need to support them. Tomorrow is our final day and we begin at 9 a.m. Dr. Lance Watson, Dr. Nathaniel West, and Dr. Melva Sampson, who will conclude our uh, Ellison Jones with our university chapel. Uh, today, we have, man, you know, we, man, 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 I, I don't know what to say. Um, it, it's interesting, and I'll share this, just a, a private thought in a public moment. Today has really been about celebrating Dr. Kenny, Lady Kenny. It's been about them. It really has. But what kind of man takes the moment for him and makes it about somebody else? Because you wasn't here, because some of you wasn't here, or because you you were here and you were as dazed that I as I am. That he took a moment that was all about him and decided to involve me and change my life forever. You, you're a big man, seriously, and hey, you're a big man. And, and I'm gonna be, be honest, and please hear me, it ain't got nothing to do with snakeology. It ain't got, no, hear me, it ain't got nothing to do with his intellectual prowess. You're a big man because you have a big heart. Yeah, I mean, Thank, thank God for all he's taught us, but I'm grateful for what he's modeled before us. So thank you for being that kind of man and you and your amazing wife. God bless you. I love her. I love watching her because when he's doing his thing, sometimes she sits there, her eyes are closed. Sometimes she shakes her head. I guess she says, I've been doing this for so long. <laughs> I didn't hurt at all. <laughs> But I know that she has been the rock in this situation. To God be the glory. Amen. Um, I have not have not done this in a splash way, but you know, do you do know I am married, and my wife is a student here, and um, I'm thanking God for scholarships. Amen. So, 
Uh, so would you stand so they can see how happily married I am? Amen. That's my wife. Amen. Amen. It's hard. It's hard when your when your wife is a student and you the dean, because she's telling me how to run the school by telling me what needs to be done. But I I love the fact that she's made this commitment. On, on the back of your program is a QR code. I'm challenging you, uh, one, to commit to 500 for 50. What is that? That's 500 persons committing to $50 a month starting in June of 2022. So if you're just committing, um, then you got some catching up to do. But you can do like the Kennys and others have done. They just wrote a $600 check for the year. All right. And the goal is $300,000 that is, that is dedicated and committed to scholarships because student debt is a, is a beast. Is a beast. And when you sit in my seat as Dean sat before me, and you get these calls from students who are frustrated. So even those of you who are watching us virtually, we, we will put up a, a way by which you yourself can also give um, and even if you're not committing to that, why not tonight before you leave, make some kind of donation to the School of Theology and support it. So the QR code allows you to do that. And it can be a one-time gift. It can be it can be a gift done over months. It can be a gift done quarterly, however you want to do it. But we need you to do that. So uh, that's my time. I do, I am now going to uh, 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 release this to this amazing music ministry from our Dean's church, our Forever Dean's church, um, and they're coming um, on the Ebenezer Mass Choir. And then and, and then the Dean of Students, who was a significant part of this school for a number of years, is coming, Dr. Deborah Martin, and she's going to introduce our phenomenal preacher. Um, and, and my wife has been waiting for you. And uh, yes, she's been waiting for you. And so, and, 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 and she is, she is one of our adjunct professors. And as well, she has an honorary, uh, a, a doctorate degree from Virginia Union. So that makes her union-ish, all right? Because, you know, I've got this thing, right? Um, but, you know, but the boundaries allows me to be union, union-it and union-ish. She's ish to it all day long. And then that, and then, and then my brother and friend, Bishop Leofric Thomas, will come and set the atmosphere. Um, and then we'll just be overwhelmed by the word of God one more night. Amen. Turn to somebody, slap them high five and tell them this is going to be amazing.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, let's put your hands together for this wonderful voices that have blessed us on tonight. We praise God. Hallelujah. It gives me great joy and privilege to stand before you and declare on tonight, there's a preacher in the house. Hailing from Memphis, Tennessee, the Reverend Dr. Gina M. Stewart is the senior pastor of Christ Missionary Baptist Church. She is the president of Library Foreign Missions Society. She is the co-convener of Women's Conference. She is an adjunct professor of multiple institutions, one of which being none other than the Samuel D. Wood Proctor School of Theology. She is a proud alumnus as she was bestowed an honorary degree from Virginia Union University, May of 2022. I humbly tell you, my brothers and my sisters, that I've had the opportunity, as she is also a mentor of many, to sit at the well of her knowledge, the well that seems to never go dry, a well that seems to overflow with the passion and the power of the Lord of Jesus Christ, a well in which overflows with the word of God. But don't worry. There's room at the well tonight. And so we invite you, my brothers and my sisters, to pull up a seat and drink from the well in the person of none other, the Reverend Dr. Gina Ann Stewart. Jay, come on, praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, lift him up. Come on, lift him up. I don't have long, but I am honored to have this privilege tonight uh, to minister at the request of our deans uh, concerning the old school church. The Lord allows me to lead one of the more contemporary churches in Jacksonville, uh, but I grew up in the Baptist church on Sunday mornings and we would meet for, for a consecration. Anybody remember those little red books called the Gospel Pearl? We would find songs there that spoke to the heart of our faith. For some reason tonight, I feel like the cross, it is the intersection of that cosmic conflict that took place on Calvary where Jesus came out the victor. But when we would prepare for communion, the old saints would say, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart My favorite verse was it for crimes that I had done? What did he do, y'all? He hung upon the tree. Amazing pit. T Where I first saw the light and the burden. I wish I had somebody. 
body of my heart rolled away. Yeah, it was death by faith. I receive, I receive my sign. Here's another one. Down at the cross, where my Savior died. <laughs> Down where from clean, cleansing of sin, I cried. Apply, sing glory to his name. Come on, let's go to Baptist Church. I'm singing. I'm singing glory. There is room at the cross for you. Come on, tell your neighbor. There is room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, still there's room. For you, say there is room at the cross for you. You know, at the cross, there was something significant that happened. Bible tells us that the blood of Jesus was shed for our sins. How many of you know the blood still works? <laughs> the blood that gives me strength ah! from day I feel like running <laughs> to day tell somebody it will Power, why, why, why? Oh, it reaches to the high yeah, mountain. Glory to God. And it flows to the low. Yes, Oh. That 
gives me strength. What about you today? From day to day. One more, I got one more. What can wash away my sin? I need to grab somebody and tell them nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Grab your number, neighbor, and tell them nothing. But the blood of Jesus, oh, precious is that blood hey, that makes me white as snow, no other Father. Nothing. <laughs> Slap half. So high five with somebody and say, nothing. Turn around and tell a neighbor, nothing. But the blood of G. I got to go. I got to go. Gina got to come back. Uh, there is power. Power. One working power. Well, you're already on your feet. Would you put your hands together and bless the Lord in this place? Come on, clap your hands and give God glory. Give God praise for Bishop ushering us into the presence of God on tonight. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. And God, we are grateful. We've entered into your gates with thanksgiving. And we've entered into your courts with praise. We're thankful tonight. And we bless your name. For you are good. And your steadfast love endures forever. Thank you for this space on this hill. Thank you for this dean who has created space, curated space, that we might be encouraged, that we might be equipped, that we might be inspired to do your will. I thank you now for this preaching moment. And I ask that you would consecrate me now to thy service, Lord. By the power of grace, divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and let my will be lost in thine. Send your anointing that makes preaching easy. Send your anointing that makes this word eternally relevant and significant for the living of these days. 
Take a coal from the altar now. Touch my lips of clay. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart might be acceptable in your sight. For you are my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name. And all those that agree with this prayer, say it together. Amen. Would you help me again appreciate all that our eyes have seen and what our ears have heard, and not just tonight, but this week. Would you help me appreciate the Dean of the School of Theology, my friend and brother for many years, Dean Dr. John Guns. Come on, you can do better than that. We thank God for his leadership and for his vision and for who he is. You may be seated in not only the kingdom, but also here at Virginia Union and the great work that he is doing to President Lucas and to the administrative administration and faculty and staff members and to this student body, to our honoree, uh, Dr. John Kenney and his beautiful wife, Mrs. Tina Kenney. Can we celebrate them on tonight? And to all of you, my brothers and sisters who walk by faith and not by sight, I count it a signal honor to be here at one of the, what I call one of the premier HBCU institutions, sharing in what many of us consider to be the equivalent of the Hamptons Ministers Conference at Virginia Union, the Ellison Convocation. Come on, you can clap your hands and agree with that. I want to express my appreciation to Dean Guns for extending this invitation to share and to be included with such an impressive roster of preachers and scholars, many of whom that I consider to be friends and, and colleagues and whose gifts are a blessing to the institution, to academia, and also to the body of Christ. Thank you, Dr. Deborah Martin, for such a generous introduction. I love Deborah Martin. She is a capable and efficient uh, administrator and also a great preacher. And she's a gift to this institution. You ought to clap your hands tonight. Come on, you could do better than that. Clap your hands tonight for the woman of God. And finally, let me express my appreciation to Dean Kenny, who some 14 years ago the first time I came to preach here at the Ellison Convocation invited me to his office and asked me to come and be a part of the faculty as an adjunct professor. I thank God for him as a purple unicorn. My goddaughter, when she wants to describe someone unique, she describes them as a purple unicorn. Dean Kenny is a unique individual, a great humanitarian, a great preacher, a great professor, a great prophet, but most of all, a great person. Can you stand on your feet? I know he doesn't like this kind of carrying on, but can we stand on our feet and honor God for blessing us with a Dr. John Kenny? An amazing mind, an amazing gift. He's the kind of person when he talks, you just shut up. Because there's nothing to say but listen and take notes. And I'm so grateful that even though I was not one of his students, I've had the opportunity to glean from his scholarship. But most of all, to appreciate what he models as a pastor and as a preacher and as a dean. I say so often, it's not often that you see genius and humility coexist. But Dr. Kenny is unique in that he is brilliant and he is a giant of a man full of humility, kindness, and generosity. And I'm grateful that God allowed me to live in the same generation as a Dr. John W. Kenny. We are better tonight because of his ministry. Thankful for all the friends that I see 
I met a lot of people here because of Virginia Union, Dr. Melva Sampson. I met Dr. Melva Sampson at Virginia Union. I met I.O. Morton, who is my watch, my, uh, watch care member at Virginia Union. So many people, Dr. Ruth Naomi Segris, I met at Virginia Union. I am grateful for all the paths that I have crossed here. Dr. Patricia Gould Champ, who is an amazing preacher, Professor, I love Dr. Patricia Goodchamp. Come on, clap your hands for the woman of God. <clears throat> There's a word from the Lord tonight. I could thank so many other people, Reverend Carla Jackson and so many others, but I wanna invite your attention to Psalm 73. As we gather our thoughts around this theme for tonight or this theme for the week, of preaching matters. And I'm going to invite you to stand with me for the reading and the hearing of the word of God. Bishop made it real churchy in here, so I may as well go ahead on and push the envelope. Dr. Kim, I may as well go on and push the envelope. Psalm 73, beginning with verse one, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of Scripture. And, and I'm breaking a homiletical rule already. I know it because it's 17 verses, but I need to read the whole passage. Read it all. Thank you. Truly God is good to the upright, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for they have no pain. Their bodies are sound and sleek. They're not in trouble as others are. They are not plagued like other people. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes well out with fatness, their hearts overflow with follies, they scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against heaven and their tongues range over the earth. Therefore, the people turn and praise them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the most high? Such are the wicked. Always at ease, they increase in riches. All in vain, I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long, I have been plagued and am punished every morning. If I had said, I will walk, I will talk on this way, I would have been untrue to the circle of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. This is the word of the Lord. Grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. As you take my seat, just shout your title to your neighbor. Tell him I almost walked away. I want to talk tonight from the subject I almost walked away. James Baldwin, the quintessential American writer and playwright, once famously said that to be Black and conscious, to be woke, if you will, or aware and actively attentive to important societal facts and issues, particularly issues of racial and social injustice in America, is to be in a constant state of rage. Baldwin's powerful and poignant insights from the past still ring true for the present time. For we are living in times that are not only traumatizing and grievous, 
are times that if you are connected to any media outlet, media source, electric or electronic or otherwise, there is always something to keep you in a constant state of rage. Whether it is an insurrection driven by one man's desperate attempt to remain in power propelled by a poisonous conspiratorial worldview and a big lie about election fraud with no evidence to substantiate it, or the hijacking of Christianity by white nationalism and white supremacy built on a myth of superiority that perpetuates and reinscribes hierarchy and structural advantage over certain groups of people, or whether it is the public humiliation of an overqualified black female jurist or the announcement that a former chief executive who incited a, an attack on democracy and conspired to overthrow a national election has just last night announced that he's running again for president or whether it is dark money and undisclosed and unlimited political spending from special interest groups that sways elections and influences voters or the denial that climate change is real or that Antarctica is melting as that the earth has a fever to be black in America, to be woke, to be thinking, to be aware of what's going on is to be in a constant state of rage. I'm still mad about Breonna Taylor. I'm still angry about Sandy Bland. I'm still angry about George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery. I'm still angry about the people who just six months ago lost their lives in a grocery store in Buffalo, New York. I'm still angry about the Emmanuel Nine. I'm still angry about the loss of Black and brown lives and the normalization and justification of murder by a broken criminal justice system. I'm, I'm still angry about black women who come up missing and they never make the news. I'm with James Baldwin tonight, who says that to be black in America is to live in a constant state of rage. Bombings and shootings ignorant attacks, intolerance, and fear. We are in a state of perpetual trauma. The erosion of trust and the loss of faith in our institutions, the deliberate attempts, the outright attempts, the blatant attempts to dismantle democracy. And for some of us, it has nothing to do with what's going on in the world, but what's just happening in your world, the day in and day out struggle of trying to be remain, remain faithful over a few things is enough to keep you in a constant state of rage. And when I think about these things through the lens of James, Balls, James Baldwin's comments, I see my own frustrations are mirrored by the writer of tonight's psalm. This psalm is attributed to Asaph, a Levite, a worshiper, a temple singer, a cymbal player, a chief musician among musicians during the reign of King David. Asaph was not a baby Christian. He handled a baby believer. He was around holy things. He handled holy things. But this singer, this cymbal player, this musician, this Levite, this prophet who had access to holy things, his access to holy things did not eliminate the frustration that he articulates in this what Brueggemann would call a psalm of disorientation. And Asaph candidly shares that he is feeling some kind of way about the discrepancy between faith and experience. He is frustrated because there are times that God just doesn't seem to make sense. I would suggest to you on tonight that Asaph is not the only person to wrestle with the mysteries or the mysterious ways of God. 
There are people in scripture and in life who would agree that sometimes God's ways just don't make sense. When God permitted Hagar and Ishmael to be thrust into will to the wilderness by her baby daddy, Abram, it just didn't make sense. When, when Joseph's brother sold him into slavery, it didn't make sense. When Job was suffering with inexplicable suffering and loss of all he possessed, he, it didn't make sense. And even when John the Baptist was sitting in prison after preparing the way of the Lord, it didn't make sense. But we don't have to talk about Ishmael and Hagar. We don't have to talk about Joseph. We don't have to talk about Job or John the Baptist. Some of you will agree with me tonight that although God is good and God is loving and God is kind and God is amazing and God is gracious and God is compassionate and God's steadfast love endures forever, that we still struggle to to understand the mysterious ways of God. Asaph, Asaph was wrestling with the strange ways of God. He, he is doing what, what any thinking person would do when they come to faith with moral and ethical depravity. Because once you see, you can't unsee. And once you know, you can't unknow. A, a thinking person, a person who comes face to face with moral, ethical, and, and ethical depravity, who sees things that are ethically troubling, sooner or later begins to wonder, are we living in a universe that is devoid of moral and ethical imperatives? He is bearing witness to personal and communal frustration for the struggle for faith in this psalm is more than just his individual and personal triumph. His confusion, Dr. Goodchamp, represents a struggle for the faith of all in his community who have put their faith in God. And so what I'm suggesting to you tonight that for Asaph, his frustration is a microcosm of the macrocosm. His struggle for clarity, for his community, what affects him affects them, and what affects them affects him. A and we should not be too surprised or taken aback as Asaph struggles or wrestles to understand God's ways, because the truth be told, when we get through lifting up holy hands, when we get through coming to worship, when we get through speaking, uh, uh, I'm blessed and highly favored every day, every week, there is something that we read and see about people who are struggling with understanding the mysterious and inexplicable ways of God. Football players killed on a college campus. Untimely deaths. The collusion with evil. The hypocrisy of the faithful. The release of persons who have committed murder on a technicality. The unchecked evil and immorality, the wicked prospering and innocent suffering, the growing disparity between the haves and the have-nots, Asaph's musings are all too familiar to us and resemble much of the frustration that thinking people find themselves wrestling with when we try to understand God's mysterious way. Truth be told, we don't have to look at the news. Truth be told, we don't have to even look to scripture. We can look at our own lives and acknowledge that as preachers and pastors and people of faith, we have had our share of moments and seasons that force us to call everything that we've ever believed into question. Oh, we won't say it out loud because we don't want people to think that we're heretic. We, we won't say it out loud because we don't want people to take our church card. We, we won't say it out loud because we don't want them to take our faith card. But the truth be told, there are moments of contradiction, even in the lives of the faithful, that in the words of that great prophet Marvin Gaye makes us want to holler and throw up both our hands. Be clear, Asaph is neither agnostic nor is he atheist. He is a believer. 
He is a worship leader. He is confused, but he's clear about his convictions. Can I put a remix on it and say in his words to contemporize his comments, he is essentially saying, I'm wrestling with some legitimate concerns. I I'm wrestling with some things that just don't make sense. But before I complain, before you write me off, before you take my robe and my hymn book, before you put me out the choir, let me be clear about my convictions. I'm clear about my convictions. I'm confused about some things that I'm seeing that don't necessarily line up. I'm confused about the discrepancy between faith and experience, but I'm clear about this here thing. Surely God is good. Surely God is good to the upright. I may not like what I see, but I'm clear about some things. I may have my doubts about some things, but I'm clear about this. Surely. Not possibly, not 50% not of the time, not 25% not of the time, not 15% of the time, but surely God is good to the upright. And God is not just good to me, God is good to the upright and to the pure in heart. And you know, I want to suggest tonight that that's the kind of conviction that we ought to have in the midst of our confusion, that there is a conviction that ought to pivot around that we find ourselves wrestling with in existential reality that there are some things we ought to be sure about. Sure that God is a covenant keeping God. Sure that God is a God who's committed. Sure that God will perfect that which he has begun and assure that the one who started the work in you is faithful to bring it to completion. Surely that God will keep his word. Sure that God will honor God's promises. Sure Sure that God is merciful and gracious. Surely that God is abounding in steadfast love. Surely God is good to the upright. I wonder do I have any witnesses that can just take about 30 seconds and give God some praise that in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of sickness, in the midst of a coronavirus, God has been good to you. Some of it you can't even explain. Some of it you don't even know how to, dis to describe it. But all you know is that God has been good. Can't you open your mouth and give God praise that God is good to the upright? Good even when we don't deserve it. Good when we're trifling. Good when we act like we on strike with God. Good when we haven't always been faithful. But even when we've been faithless, God has been faithful. Do I have any witnesses in here tonight who can declare, surely God is God is good, but especially to those who are upright in heart. But then he goes on to write, but something is wrong with this picture. He suggests that he was seduced, in the words of Dr. Claudette Anderson Copeland, to the edge of black backsliding. Notice what he says. He says, surely God is good to the upright, especially those who are pure in heart. But as for me, I can't speak for anybody else. As for me, my foot almost slipped. I nearly lost my foothold. I, I almost, Dr. Melba, went over the edge when I saw and I observed the prosperity of the wicked. And we need to note in this case that prosperity does not just refer to material blessings, but general well-being. It refers to peace and soundness of mind. He said, he said, I couldn't help but notice that the wicked who don't love God, the wicked who don't reverence God, the wicked who don't fear God, the wicked who have no respect for God, the wicked seem to have no trouble at all. It's in the text. He said they're financially stable. They, they live well. They eat well. They drive well. They're never sick. They seem to have the Midas touch. They live in the life of the fresh prince of Bel-Air. I'm trying to live right. I'm trying to serve you. I'm trying to worship you. I'm trying to acknowledge you in all of my ways. I'm coming to worship and I'm still struggling. Asaph says that when I finally began to notice this, I almost lost it. 
You can tell the truth tonight. Ain't nobody in here but us. He said, when I, when I really looked at it, when I really examined this, I almost walked away because I could see no connection between the prosperity of the wickedness and the, the wicked and the goodness of God. And if we can tell the truth and, and take off our deep faces and, and take off our deep hats, if we, if we can really tell the truth tonight, some of us have been in that place. Some of us have been in that place where we have said, this ain't right. This makes no sense. This is not fair. This just does not measure up. He is doing what you and I and others from scripture have done in the face of inequity, iniquity, and suffering. He is resting with the complexities of faith that make theologians out of all of us, even if we're armchair theologians. He is wrestling with why the wicked, uh, why the wicked prosper, while the, lang the righteous language, why the ungodly and the wicked enjoy the best of health and wealth, while it seems that the godly barely seem to get ahead. He's asking the question. The Dr. Uh, Melissa Harris Perry asked uh, when she went to a Union Theological Seminary, she was uh, conducting a seminar at our church and she said, people think I'm a preacher because I went to Union. She said, I didn't go to Union because I'm a preacher. She, was, she said, I went to Union, Dr. Kenny, because I wanted to find out what kind of God that my grandmother would serve, would serve him and still believe that he loved her when all the evidence suggested otherwise. She said, I didn't go because I was trying to learn how to preach. I went because I wanted to know about my grandmama's God. I wanted to know what kind of God could cause her to be, could be so compelling in who he was that my grandmother could still believe that God loved her when the evidence suggested otherwise. Asaph is doing what most of us do. When there's a discrepancy between faith and experience, why does God permit the suffering of the righteous and carefree existence of the wicked? Since God is in control, why does such unfairness, such inequity, such injustice, such inequality exist? Why won't you tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains might quake at your presence? Make matters worse. The psalmist Reverend Malik observed that their trouble-free lives allowed the wicked to become proud. In fact, they put on pride like a piece of jewelry, clothe themselves with violence. They become insensitive to the things of God and multiply iniquity instead. In the boundless conceit of their minds, they scoff and threaten oppression with arrogance. And there's usually no accountability. There's no limit to their pride for they boastfully claim control of heaven. They are reckless and impetuous, either out of fear or because of deception. Their people turn to them and drink the Kool-Aid. Having claimed control over God's creation, they carelessly assert that God doesn't have a clue to what they're doing. Asaph said, this is why I'm having some issues here. This is why I'm struggling. This is why I'm almost, I almost went over the edge. This is why my foot had almost slipped because this is what the wicked are like, always carefree, increasing in wealth. And to make matters worse, they attract disciples. They attract followers who willingly climb onto the bandwagon of their abundance, even if it means subscribing to a theology of an irrelevant God. So Asaph said, my foot, hey, had just about slipped. <laughs> I was just about to go over the edge. I almost walked away because I was searching for clarity regarding the question of faith validity because the problem is not with the goodness of God, but what he sees that challenges God's goodness. In other words, Asaph is saying, I've seen too much. Some of us know about seeing too much. When I was growing up in church, they used to say, baby, you'll be all right. Just stay out the office. 
They may just stay away from walk, working behind the scenes uh, so you can maintain your naivete and, and your innocence. Some of us have seen too much. Uh, we won't say it out loud, but we've seen too much, seen too much evil, seen too much duplicity, seen too much corruption, seen too much abuse of power. Sometimes you've seen too much and, and life has a way of destroying your faith. He said, I almost threw in the towel. <laughs> Got to mighty. He said, my foot almost slipped. I almost gave up. I almost walked away when I saw these things because I felt that righteous living was in vain. What's the purpose of piety? What's the purpose of ethical living? What is the benefit of living godly? What difference does God really make? How can one being God's reconcile the justice of God with the inequities in the world, including personal and perpetual, perpetual suffering? I like the way the message translation puts it. It says, what's going on here? Is God out to lunch? Nobody's tending the store. The wicked get by with everything. They haven't made their piling of riches. What does it profit to play by the rules? This is the question Asaph essentially raises, and it is the question that many of the faithful raise in response to what seems to be the flourishing of evil and wickedness. Why should I continue to serve God and deny myself when evil still seems to go, what good seems to go unrewarded. This is the eternal turmoil that Asaph is experiencing as he wrestled with his private frustration. He has not publicly articulated his frustration. It's public now because it's in the scripture. But at the moment, his struggle was internal. And although he is weighed down by what he sees, he has an awareness that to publicly articulate what he feels privately could potentially be a letdown for the fellowship of believers to which he belongs. But his silence doesn't resolve his struggle. He doesn't say anything out loud because he doesn't want to be responsible for dragging other people along with him. But his silence, his, his refusal to articulate, Reverend Stephanie, his frustration doesn't resolve his struggle. He's weighed down from all that he has observed and he almost walked away because he was deeply pondering, is it really worth it? But then there's a shift in the narrative. Asaph comes to a moment of clarity concerning his inquiry. He says, but before I opened my mouth, before I went public, before I resigned from my position, before I quit, before I conceded to despair before I walked away from the faith, before I walked away from God, before I concluded that faith was a farce. It's in the text. He said, I went to the sanctuary. <laughs> He said, I, I messed around and I went to church. It's in the text. Asaph said, till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Uh, it was when he went to the sanctuary. It, it, it was when he went to church with his philosophy, before going public with his philosophy and resigning his office that Asaph paused to ponder the consequences. And when he considered the consequences of the possibility of abandoning the faith and the impact that it would have on the community of believers, Asaph came to a conclusion. He resolved that the remedy for his pain was not a resurrection, a resignation of his faith, but a resurrecting and a reigniting of his faith. He said, until I went to the sanctuary, until I decided to go to the church, until I decided to go to the house of the Lord and spend some time in worship, until I went 
to the sanctuary where he could be among the fellowship of believers until he gathered in the assembly with the people of faith, until he sang the songs of Zion and went into the sanctuary where he could hear the word of God and the songs of praise and be a part of the worshiping community. Asaph said, I almost walked away, but then I messed around. And I went to church. I wish I had some company in here tonight that could testify that you were in that same place. Ah, but you went to the sanctuary. And I have a sneaky suspicion that when Asaph went to the sanctuary, when Asaph went to church and heard the word and sang the songs of praises and gathered in the assembly of the faithful, he discovered that the Lord or Jehovah was not a problem to wrestle with, but a gracious person to love and to worship, especially when you can't figure out what God is doing. I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise shall continue continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord and the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt God's name together. And I know, I know, I know where I am. I know that there are some who would argue that the church has lost its relevance. I know that there are those who would argue that you can grow your faith without church. I know that for many brunch has now become the worship hour. I know that there are some that would argue that the church is full of hypocrites and there is moral failure in the church and the church is too judgmental and people are too self-absorbed and people are too self-righteous and the church is anti-intellectual and they've been hurt in the church and the truth be told, all of that is true. Uh, everything they say is true about the church, but I also can't deny that while the church can be a hurtful and disappointing place, I can't deny that the church doesn't have its challenges. I can't deny that it's not an imperfect place filled with imperfect people, made up of finite and fallen human beings, broken folk and brokenness that leads to messiness and disappointment. Oh, but can I tell you, I've been in church all my life and I have seen some things I wish I hadn't seen. I know some stuff I wish I didn't know, oh, but in spite of the shortcomings, I've seen God work in imperfect people and do some amazing things. I wouldn't be the woman I am tonight if it wasn't for the church. I wouldn't have the faith I have if it wasn't for the church. I've seen the grace of God in the church. I've seen the hurt healed in the church. I've seen the loss restored in the church. I've seen deliverance in the church. And I stopped by the to tell somebody tonight that I'm still glad that I went to church. Hey, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord because something happens when you go to church. Isaiah received his commissioning when he went to church. It was against the backdrop of depravity. And in the year that King Uzziah died, then he went into the sanctuary and he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, who will go for us and whom shall I send? So do me a favor and help me close this thing and tell somebody I've been frustrated, I've been angry, I've been disappointed, I've been ready to throw in the towel, I've been ready to give up, and I almost walked away, but I'm glad on this Wednesday night that I went to the church, and it was there that I got some clarity. I wonder, do I have a few witnesses that know that something can still happen when you come into the sanctuary, when you come and search for God with your whole heart, when you come to church, 
burdens are lifted when you come to church doubts are removed when you come to church fears are disappear when you come to church hope is restored when you come to church your heart is encouraged your eyes are open perspective is renewed clouds are lifted and sanity is restored do I have any witnesses that can throw your head back and tell God thank you that it was when you went to church and took your eyes off of the problem and put your eyes on the problem solver that your joy came back that your strength came back that your help came back when we go to church not to gossip not for entertainment something happens when we go to church and I stop by on my way to heaven to tell somebody that's why preaching matters that's why the word matters the word yes sir is nigh thee even in thy mouth that's why when the word is proclaimed that's why when the preacher preaches something happens and you feel like yes sir you can run on and see what the is gonna be do i have anybody that can tell god thank you that you went to church i found love at the church i found peace at the church i found joy at the church i found strength at the church i found deliverance at the church but most of all i met jesus at church oh hell the power of Jesus name let angels prostrate fall bring forth the royal diadem crown him king of kings crown him lord of lords yes sir yeah yeah somebody tell them almost but not quite find somebody tell them almost but not quite I almost gave up I almost threw in the towel I almost walked away but if you're glad jump to your feet open your mouth clap your hands let the redeem of the Lord, yes, sir. Say something. He delivered me out of the hand of the enemy. He made a way where there was no way. He prepared a table in the presence, yes, sir, of my enemies. Shout, yeah, 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 yeah. Give him glory. Clap your hand. All you people, shout to God with the voice of triumph. You shall live and not die. You shall declare the works of the Lord. Your best days are still in front of you, and it does not yet appear. Yes, sir. What God has in store. Keep going to church. Keep listening to the word. Keep preaching preachers. Keep teaching scholars. Keep theologizing. Theologians. Somebody needs to know this ain't all that there is. Give them glory. Yeah. Give him glory. I dare you to turn this auditorium 
auditorium into a church. I dare you to turn this room into a church. I dare you to put your feet on it. I dare you to give him glory. I dare you to give him praise. I dare you to shout. I dare you to give God the shout that the devil thought he took. Take 30 seconds and act like you at church. Christ missionary, Jacksonville, Florida. That's a missionary. Come on here and give him glory. Come on here and give him praise. Come on here. You better go in and put your feet on it. Look at somebody say, I ain't gonna let nothing keep me from church. I might be broke, I might be sick, I might be busted and disgusted, but nothing shall separate me from the love of Jesus. Persuaded that death, no life, no powers, no principalities, light, no death, neither height, nor death, things present, things to come, shall be able to die. Give them glory. turn this auditorium into a church. Come on, preachers. You want everybody else to shout. You want everybody else to dance. Get out in that aisle and give him glory. Come on, worship leaders. Come on, singers, musicians, pastors, prophets, bishops, potates, magistrates, let everything. grew up in the kind of church that when it got like this, you just go for it. Look down your row and tell your neighbor, I almost, but this dance and for the fact I didn't. Okay, some of y'all acting cute. I need you to tell your neighbor, you might want to give me room because I feel a run, I feel a shout. I know I'm in Ellison, I know I'm in the chapel, but right now we're going to give God because there's victory in this room, man. Yes, it is. There's victory. There's victory in this room. What a night. 
What a night. What a night. What a day. What a day. What a day at Ellison. What a day at Ellison. What a day at Ellison Joe Convocation. What a day. What a day. It started with Stephanie saying, you better not stop. And it ended with the almost. Hey, hey, we going, we going home. Or we going somewhere. I don't know where you going, but we going home. Everybody's staying, <laughs> ain't nothing else to say. Gina Stewart, we are glad that you are union-ish. Yes, Lord. We started this day um, being challenged by the morning message. Theron Williams just wouldn't let up. Our dean, who will never have a panel again, because it's, it's unfair just blessed us. The documentary gave us a snapshot and I need them to fix it because the end needs to say to be continued because Dean God ain't even finished yet. So much more to do for you too. Had an amazing luncheon and then walked in here tonight. Leofra Thomas just didn't let us settle in. And then Gina Stewart. We start at nine. See y'all tomorrow.